How do you do, Bill? Good I'm, afternoon. Hey, <laughs> man, that's a nice piece there. That's a track you wrote, isn't it? Yeah, gee, it sounds awful nervous, doesn't it? <laughs> nervous? This sounds fantastic. <laughs> These guys are going towards the barn. <laughs> <laughs> What's that called? Stereo Blue is the name of that? Stereo Blue, mm -hmm. yeah. It it was part of a piece that uh, I wrote for uh, a CJR or Toronto's by Sesquicentennial. It was a big concert with the mm -hmm. CJRT Symphony and the Boss Brass. So this is part of a bigger piece that I wrote out for the band. Well, there's a lot of writing in that. Yeah, there seems to be quite a few notes. They must yeah. have been on their toes. I should learn how to write whole notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's been done. Either that or get paid by the note, maybe. Hmm. Whoa. <laughs> you know something, Rob? What were Rob McConnell's interests as a young boy growing up in London, Ontario? Well, I, di I didn't. Uh, I was born in London, Ontario, Bill, but I, I grew up here mm -hmm. in Toronto. And uh, my interests, gee, did I have any interests? I guess n nothing uh, particular. I sang in choirs a lot. Actually, uh, records I brought in today, I found that out of six, four are vocal albums. Is that so right? that might have something to do with what, what I this, listened to. Uh, was this at a church or something you were singing? Yeah, in, in North Toronto at uh, St. George's United Church. At one time, my dad and mother and uh, two sisters and two brothers all sang in the choir. So all all sev a seven-piece family were, were all in the uh, the same choir at the same church and uh, went to John Ross Robertson and uh, started playing in high school. Is that what you did? You started playing uh, what, pick up the trombone in high school? or? Uh, I actually wanted to play trumpet and they just, uh, when they got to the M's all they had was trombone. Trombone. They left. said, well, yeah, do you want this? And I said, well, not really. And they said, well, it's either that or go to art class, you know, the big option scene in those days. Right. Actually, Gord Rayner was the painter was in and musician was in the art class at Northern, and I was in music, and we both kind of wanted to be in the other. I thought, gee, I'd, I think I'd really rather paint, paint or draw, draw than up. play. And uh, he was the other <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> I know they stuck me with clarinet, man. I don't know why. Oh, that's a really that bad. was low, wasn't it? <laughs> that was a low blow. <laughs> wanted me to march and chew gum and all that at the same time. I couldn't do it. Well, the clarinet's really hard when they're kids. It seems that the, the my youngsters, you know, the clarinet section of the North Toronto Collegiate Banner. My daughter, but both my daughters played the flute. One mm. is through school now. The flutes were always below me there, sitting in the chairs. So yeah, but they didn't. They didn't have. Any, they don't have any reeds to worry about and all that. The poor clarinets, and they're always squawking away. You got ugly lips. The girls don't <laughs> want to kiss you. They don't even get near you. you know. How were you introduced to the world of jazz? Well, I guess through uh, older brother. Uh, older brother Alan uh, was a trumpet player, so he's seven years older than I am. So he played all Roy Eldridge records, Harry James. Uh, we had a a 78 wind-up record player and that when he was playing trumpet he he used to play along with records with Tommy Dorsey's We'll Get It and Charlie Shavers and Bunny Berrigan and all those guys mm -hmm. and uh, Gene Krupa's band and uh, that was you know I was you know, with a brother seven years older than you like he was he was the guiding light. He was light. pretty hip, huh? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. He had girlfriends and everything. You know, it was great. Right. <laughs> so I just kind of followed him around like a little dog, and they used to have rehearsals at my parents' house, and it was pretty awful, I think. You know, really, if I could have, could listen to them now, but they liked to play and swing, and uh, they were we used to rehearse in our front room. And when I got to high school, I started doing... Just doing the same thing, just, uh, you know, uh, well, I'll do that too. You know. Little brother <laughs> hanging on. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is this where your formal training began? Well, I don't know that I've had any formal training. Uh, I studied arranging, uh, uh, I studied with Gord Delamont when I was uh, 20, started with guests around when I was 22, 23 years old. I was married, I had a child by then, but, so that was... I was getting serious about, uh, I think I'm going to be a musician, it's obviously I can't do anything else, uh, you know, I've done a lot of dumb jobs and this and that, and I had one attempt at going straight when I got married, I was working in the brokerage business, but then I started playing part-time and then eventually left the brokerage and started playing what was referred to as full-time, 
you know, but when you're starting, <laughs> was that two I nights mean, a week? Or? Uh, two <laughs> nights was a good week. Yeah, this is two nights this week, and then a couple of slow weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, so that was my only series. I never studied the trombone uh, uh, or took lessons or anything. So I just you had an incredible feel for it then. Well, I played slide trombone until about that time when I was in the brokerage business, and then actually I borrowed a valve trombone from Ron Collier, who is now, uh, you know, teaching at Humber, Humber. and uh, runs a stage band there. And uh, actually, he's mad at me since that time, which is uh, 30 years ago, that I didn't return his case, and he had this uh, old case. Uh, uh, it was just kind of a bag, you know. Well, it just uh, disintegrated at one time. And I didn't have the heart to tell him for 15 years, but then I finally did. Oh, well, you want to call him on the phone? We could resolve this. <laughs> well, occasionally we see each other, and he says, where's my case? And I said, I'm still looking for it. <laughs> anyway, then I, was, then I was just kind of a valve trombone player. And then when it became, when I got busier and got better gigs... Uh, I was so out of shape on slide trombone that I played them on valve trombone, that's all. So then I, then I tried doing both for a while, never successfully, so I just... Well, okay, this is the instrument I play, I guess, one. yeah, yeah. You know, I know as a kid I couldn't wait for the next copy of Downbeat to arrive in the mail. Did you search through these jazz publications for information on artists that are music? Oh yeah, I remember living uh, with uh, two bass players, Lenny Boyd and Kenny Sprang on Earl Street, you know, and uh, we used to devour all downbeats, yes. and uh, I think Kenny had a collection going right back, like every month, all catalog and everything, and I still read downbeat Same. and enjoy it, and um, then it was also going out and buying records. Between us, we'd buy one record a week or something, you know, and then with two bass players as roommates, they were always trying to find the changes, so I usually did the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd all learn the tune together, uh, sort of. Uh, they would get the bass notes down really fast, but then some, maybe sometimes I would get some of the inside harmonies faster. Yeah. And uh, we learned a lot of tunes doing that. It was just, uh, I guess, just an interest in music, and we, you're not very busy. You have so much time when well, you're that Well, there's no old. pressure at that time. No, it's just... Oh, it's just I can, boy, I look. I don't want to be that age again, but I sure like to have the time that I had. Absolutely. That, you know that, just wasting away. Uh, you just played uh, cooking at the Continental. I mean, I I took a I don't know how many hours to learn that on a, you know, with no tape, and da 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 da. Da, 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 you know, da, 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 you know, and learning how to play it. Well, it was just fun. Well, I don't seem to have time to do that anymore. No, it's quite. It's changed quite a bit. I even know, you know, having a, a son, and so forth, that his time is so divided. How can he even concentrate on something like this now? You know, because everything is is just blown in everybody's face so much. You have to do this. 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 We don't have the same time we used to to sit down like that and. Transcribe well, uh, records. Well, basically, I was a bum. You see, that's where I had all the time. I wasn't going to school. I wasn't getting further education. I was uh, probably uh, we go and deliver uh, circulars for a day to make our rent, or or you know other stuff. I mean, we are kind of not very uh, um, academic oriented. You know, yes. like I'm a grade ten dropout and. I mean, it's just for years, I mean, we just played and lived at different spots, lived uh, and hung around the house of Hamburg and all this stuff in Toronto. Well, there was n so there's no job pressure. Uh, was, uh, there was no home. I mean, I guess the big pressure was just get enough for your food and your $12 a week for rent or whatever. So when did you become interested in arranging and when did you be start, you know, trying to piece this together? Well, when I was quite young. I was always uh, trying to impose my view on other people, uh, which is generally how it gets you started arranging, because you don't, you're dissatisfied with everybody just goofing off and jamming the ending of something, so you say, well, man, we should go to this chord, and you should play this, and right. do that. And so it was more experimental with no, where you put the notes and so forth? Oh, yeah, and lifting things, uh, lifting songs off records, I found that, you know, I have a fairly good ear, and... I just, after listening to, I'd be puzzled by what it was. Like, 
try lift that chart of uh, of Robert Farnan. I mean, there's a you know a month's work, and uh, <laughs> then then you won't know what the heck he's doing anyway, <laughs> because he just you know does things that nobody knows what he's doing. Pretty but, extraordinary. Uh, yeah. So I've always just kind of done that. Uh, all those horse old horse silver records. I mean, I learned every tune, both parts, and can still play a lot of the harmony parts. You know. Just always, uh, I was just kind of interested in that. I, a lot, a lot of trombone players end up being arrangers, you know, because you're always playing harmony parts. Right. Very tell, very seldom are you playing the lead, or you know, you're down on thirds and sevenths and everything. You think, gee, these are nice notes, and then you get to flat nines and thicker things, and you think, like, you know, the '70s were the financial heyday for many of our local greats. Did you find yourself traveling from one studio to another week after week during this period? Yeah. Yeah, 60s and 70s, I guess, mm -hmm. were really my uh, good years, uh, and there's a lot of work around and uh, for for acoustic instruments like uh, yeah. four trombones, four trumpets, five saxes, and strings, and big gigs, and uh, yeah, uh, I was telling some youngster that was working with me recently that one month I did 32 jingles, one, like as a, as a third, second or third trombone player. It's terrific. So, I mean, I wouldn't do 32 jingles now in a year. Uh, it's all changed. Much less, it? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, they were the real glory days. I mean, there was always seemed to be a radio show on every week or every day, yeah. or a television show every week or sometimes every day. So now you go in, you see this little stop on a keyboard. It says trombone. And you say, there I am. <laughs> there goes my life. There it is. <laughs> How did the Boss Brass come into existence? Well, originally it was just a, an idea at, at some tr some time of unemployment, uh, likely. i get some great idea, or not so great, and this, this was uh, the Canadian Talent Library were starting uh, doing, well, actually they hadn't started doing it yet, but, but I went and proposed to the, the head of it, Lyman Potts at the time, took him out for lunch. And, friends <laughs> and said you know you should be doing cover records of hit parade material and I'll get a band together called the Boss Brass and I'll do the writing and I'll be the leader and it'll be four trombones, four French horns, four trumpets, right. rhythm and it'll be terrific and uh, over a very short time he said okay do it so we did it and uh, it just kind of went on from there that was 68 yeah. so it's uh, so you did mostly one major. more more year we'll did all of it. Did yeah. all of it at the time. Yeah, and played the odd little, pooped in on the odd solo, and it was mostly uh, our very first record was, oh, we recorded Delilah and uh, of Tom Jones and Little Green Apples. Oh, and, I love these songs. Keep and, going. <laughs> <laughs> so they were they, they weren't remotely associated with jazz, but then as the band started to do club dates and that, I I got more dissatisfied with doing that type of record. And, Eventually, we changed it, added five saxophones in '71, and became a, a no holds barred jazz band. Right. And uh, it's kind of it's kind of funny. It's it's having the jazz band that was successful for me. 